Hello, welcome back to the Strategy YouTube channel. Today we're looking at three unique win cons. These are combinations that we can build around and include in our decks to try to go for the win. I should say off the bat that these combos are not going to be in the same league as something like Demonic Consultation, Thassa's Oracle. And in fact, I anticipate that people in the comments are going to say that these win conditions may be too slow or too janky to actually be considered win cons at all. And that's totally fine. There is no universal decider that determines if something is or is not a win condition and it really comes up to somebody's interpretation. That being said, I do personally consider these to be win conditions, but I consider them something I like to call a soft win condition, as opposed to something like Thassa's Oracle, which I would consider a hard win condition. Here's a chart I've thrown together to illustrate what I'm talking about. There's two variables I'm using to consider the types of win cons. Their vulnerability, that is to say how easy or difficult it is to interrupt that whole process, or their speed to end the game, which to me represents how many turns it's going to take before you win the game after doing the thing you want to do. I imagine somebody could break it down even further or even create new categories through it, but as a place to start, I've created three categories for both vulnerability and speed to end the game. For vulnerability, we start with safe. If your win con is safe, that means there's two or less opportunities for other players in the game to disrupt what you're about to do. That could be wiping the board, counter spells, stifle effects, or targeted destruction. For something to fall into the average vulnerability category means to me that there's three to four opportunities to disrupt that win con. And for something to fall under the risky category means there's five or more opportunities to disrupt that win condition. When it comes to speed to end the game, I've split it into three groups, fast, average, and slow. The fast category is full of win cons that you need to stop as soon as they start or else the game is over this turn. The average speed to end category is win conditions that are going to win within the next two or three turns. And the slow category in my eyes is win conditions that take four or more turns once you start them to actually end the game. As you can see, the hard win cons are those that are at the extremes of either variable. They're either extremely lethal or extremely dependable. Either way, they're so consistently reliable in what they do that they warrant an entire deck being built around them. And on the other hand, the soft win cons are those win conditions that don't necessarily excel in one category or the other. And that isn't to say that soft win cons are better or worse than hard win cons. So long as it can function as a win con and end the game for you, it's still good. The thing about a soft win con is it's not fast enough to end the game before your opponents get a chance to untap with their mana, and it's not persistent enough to be relied on to remain on the board after things like board wipes go through. So to use a soft win con in your deck, you need to think about it differently than you would with a hard win con. You can't build a deck that goes all in on depending on this win con and expect it to do well. Your win con's gonna crack under the pressure. Instead, you need to design your deck so that it can function decently well even if your win con never goes off. That way if your win con gets exiled while it was sitting on the board you're not going to be completely out of the game. Another thing that would help is to include a backup win condition whether it be redundant or a completely different way to win just in case the first win con doesn't work out. If you do those things your deck is still going to be able to reach that consistent power level that the hard win cons can reach. Because you're not putting so much pressure on that win con you can function and be more flexible without it. All that being said after every Every win condition we go over in this video today, I'm going to pull up this chart again and show you where I think that one falls on this list. And first for today is Imperial Archangel. It's an 8 mana 5 8 with flying and shroud, meaning it cannot be targeted by spells or abilities I or any other player controls. Imperial Archangel also redirects all damage that would go to you to itself instead. Now, the tricky thing about Imperial Archangel is that it has shroud, not hexproof or ward, which means we can't target it with spells or abilities we control either. That probably means no plus one plus one counters, no equipment, and no combat tricks to buff its health. So if we take eight or more damage to the face, the Archangel is likely to go down. But we do actually have a way we can sneak some buffs onto it without targeting it. And that comes in the form of auras, but not auras that we cast. When you cast an aura, you have to choose a target for it to enchant. So we can't just throw any old aura on this creature. What we need is auras that attach themselves to a creature without any targeting required. And lucky for us, there's a few. Shielded by Faith must have a target when we initially cast it, but then afterward, whenever a creature enters the battlefield, we can move it onto that creature without targeting. Meaning we can sneak a Shielded by Faith onto the Imperial Archangel when it enters the battlefield. And then any damage we take gets redirected to the Archangel, which just shrugs it off anyway. Another one we can use is Gift of Doom. What we do is cast it for its morph cost, and then sacrifice a different creature to flip it. Once it flips to its front face, it becomes an enchantment aura, and then we can attach 
attach it to a creature we control. So either of these cards are going to work to make our Imperial Archangel indestructible, meaning we're preventing all the damage we take so long as it's on the board. And this combo is actually fairly sturdy on the battlefield, which is important considering it's not going to be closing the game on its own very quickly. The only way our opponents are going to be able to deal with this is if they can destroy the aura that's attached to the angel, or otherwise wipe the board without using a destroy effect, like a bounce or an exile. Another way we can do this more consistently is to run a couple of the cards that allow you to return enchantments from the graveyard to the battlefield, because when you return an aura from the graveyard to the battlefield, it needs to find a viable candidate to attach itself, but this does not target. And if we lean that way, there's plenty more auras that can give protection, indestructible, or regenerate that we can slap on the Archangel. As far as commanders go that might benefit from this in their deck, I think of Atraxa Grand Unifier. You're in all the colors you need then, and it can help you find your combo pieces, and your commander is also an angel. Another thing to consider when building around the Archangel is that Angel's Herald is a one mana 1-1 one, one that can tutor it up for you, right onto the battlefield. So if we can tutor up the Angel's Herald somehow, then we can use the Angel's Herald and sacrifice a bunch of creatures to get the Archangel out even sooner. To that end, I think the best candidate is Ellie and Alan, Paleontologist. They'll let you exile a one drop from your graveyard to flip until you hit another one drop and put it onto the battlefield for free. So aside from Angel's Herald, just limit your one drops to maybe creatures that untap another creature or otherwise draw you cards or can help you find your Herald. When looking at this combo, I consider it to be a soft win condition. I think its vulnerability is average. Like I said, it's kind of hard to get off the battlefield. You'd have to get rid of the aura first and then remove the angel. But if they can remove that aura at instant speed during combat, a bunch of creatures could get in and hit the player, which causes the angel to die anyway, saving them a removal spell. And for speed to end the game, I put it at slow. This combo can prolong the game and keep you alive, but it's not going to really kill anybody unless you keep swinging with the angel, which is fine. It's a flying, indestructible, potentially death touch creature. And you could even stack more auras on top of it, but it's likely not going to be ending the game for you in two to three turns. The next win con on my list is combining Crafty Cut Purse with Oversimplify. So the way this works is we cast Crafty Cut Purse on our main phase. That way for the rest of the turn, any tokens that enter the battlefield under an opponent's control enter on our side instead. Then we cast Oversimplify, which exiles all the creatures on the board straight up. Then each player creates a fractal token with 1-1 one, one counters on it equal to the combined power of all the creatures they just lost. But because we cast Crafty Cut Purse first, they all enter the battlefield under our control. So the way we're going to win with this combo is we play it on our turn when everybody else's board is full. You're waiting for that crucial moment before armies clash, and then we'd have these huge tokens that we can just beat our opponents with until they die. Both of these cards are in the Commander 2021 set, which makes me believe that they were designed this way on purpose and they fit together. But I was looking on EDH Rec and I wasn't seeing a lot of people comboing these two cards, so maybe there's not an appreciation for the potential lethality here, or maybe I'm overhyping it, but to me this looks like a clear-cut, interesting, fun win condition, and when are you going to exile all the other creatures on the board in Simic colors? Who's going to see this coming? I have no idea. When we're thinking about the commander deck that pilots this combo, we need to keep in mind that any creatures we have on the battlefield are going to get swept up in the board wipe with the rest of them. So we want a commander that's doing the job before we combo or after. And I think the perfect commander for this deck is Gore Moldrak, Amphenologist. He's going to be keeping us safe while also making sure there's always some creatures on the board to make our combo worth casting. And where this combo falls on the list, I have it right in the middle at average. So it's not quite a hard win con or a soft win con, it's in that area in between where it could go either way. The last win con I have for you today is one that I've affectionately nicknamed Get in the Soup. The key to this combo is Bubbling Cauldron, a two mana artifact that says you can pay one and sacrifice a creature to gain four life, or you can pay one and sacrifice a creature named Festering Newt. If you do, each opponent loses four life, and you gain life equal to the life lost this way. Now you might be saying, wait a second, you can only have one Festering Newt in your deck. And yes, you are technically correct. But what we can do is change a creature's name to Festering Newt and then sacrifice it in the cauldron. Cauldron. It turns out the cauldron isn't very specific, it just wants to know that your name is Festering Newt before it throws you in the soup. We can pretty easily get away with this too, using a card like Psychic Paper or Spy Kit. Both of these equipment equip for two and give the equipped creature the name Festering Newt in addition to its other names. Meaning every turn we can equip a new creature giving it the name Festering Newt and then throw it in the soup. In total this is going to cost us 3 mana to gain 12 life and deal 4 damage to each of our opponents. Now of course we have to tap the cauldron to sacrifice the 
creature to gain the life and deal the damage, which means we can't easily repeat that effect. But if we use a card like Clock of Omens, we can tap our equipment to untap the Bubbling Cauldron. And this will be even more powerful if we have artifact creature tokens, because we can tap them, equip them, then throw them in the soup. Speaking of clocks, we can also use Unwinding Clock to untap the cauldron and our mana rocks. Equipping happens at sorcery speed though, so we need to put the paper on a new creature before the end of our turn, so that next turn we can sack it right away and throw it in that soup. And if you really want to be crazy and maximize your soup output, we can run cards like Artificer's Class, which is going to make copies of the Bubbling Cauldron, exponentially growing our soup output. We can be in the life gain theme, we can be in the direct damage theme, we're obviously going to be in the artifact theme. So what I think would be a strong commander in this deck is Rebecca, Architect of Ascension. As long as Rebecca is out, our Psychic Paper and our Bubbling Cauldron are going to be protected from CMC2. And this protection can stack up as we have more and more random artifacts out there. Rebecca also has Partner, so we can splash whatever colors we want. And I think a good partner for this deck would be Silas Wren, Seeker Adept. That way, if either of our equipment or the cauldron goes to the graveyard, we can get it back again. As far as the types of win conditions go, this win con is very soft. The combo is going to be a slow churning of value that happens every turn, so you know you're not going to be winning the game consistently before turn 3. And as far as vulnerability goes, this combo is very vulnerable. Artifacts are easy to get off the battlefield. And all it will take is for somebody to exile the cauldron, and that win condition is going to be shut off for the rest of the game. This combo is a great example of why you should have backup win cons in your deck, or else build the deck to be value-y and last on its own. I love Bubbling Cauldron, I do, but I also know I can't rely on it or expect it every single game. Instead, I'm going to fill my deck with artifact token good stuff, which will still be decently strong with Rebecca. And that's going to be it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. How do you feel about the division of win cons from hard to soft? Do you agree with me that soft win cons are indeed win cons? Or would you argue that they're just value generators? And lastly, thank you to everyone who's subscribing and leaving comments on my videos. I never could have dreamed that my channel would grow so rapidly like it is. And it's just mind boggling to see all of the positive support and interesting and creative conversations happening in this community that we're building together. So thank you very much for watching.